Thanks, Mark. Um, I've always considered Mark a really wise man, so I'm really glad that now he has the beard to, to go along. <laughs> and fully expect you every time I make a, an interesting point to just, you know, <laughs> go like that. Um, I also uh, want to thank Mark, Amanda, Sean, which uh, are the people that I was in contact with, uh, but also the um, Creative Mornings team, which I'm learning is bigger than I expected, uh, for having me here. Uh, I also want to thank the guys behind the Interlink Conference for generously sponsoring our breakfast today. Um, also W2 for the venue. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, all of you, the amazing creative community of Vancouver, for waking up early and being here today. So um, I'll start by showing you some of my work. This is the latest CD I did for Warner Music. I really enjoyed working with Jimena. She's an amazingly talented artist. And this is a close-up of, of the illustration. Uh, this is a work I did for uh, DDB. They hired me to create these photo illustrations for the software company Intuit. You're probably familiar with their software for uh, making your taxes. This is one of my favorite pieces. Uh, it's a personal work. It's called Power and Magic. Um, the uh, medium is ceramic and wood. It's, uh, it's a totem. The masks are based on uh, masks from different cultures and their electric outlets. It's inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's statement that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, this is from a series I developed based on the mathematics of nonlinear dynamic systems. Uh, the end result is achieved by combining different evolutions of the same seed or equation and then uh, layering them in Photoshop. And um, this is the final piece as it hangs in my home. But I'm not going to spend too much time talking about my work. Um, if you Google my name, you can find links to it. Uh, you will also find that I actually hold a master's degree in education from Harvard. Um, I, I, I don't know Mr. Contreras, but, uh, but I felt great holding his diploma. <laughs> You'll also find that uh, I finished the thesis for Beware of Images at Stanford. Um, I literally busted my ass there. Those are very uncomfortable steps. And finally, that it's all based on research I conducted at UBC. Um, the data showed, by the way, the data showed that, uh, yes, Chick do dig documentary director, so uh, <laughs> right away I started production. Um, I have no, no idea how many times I've been invited to speak just because people don't click on those links and they, they buy into them. And I, that's probably why Mark invited me to talk today. Um, which um, brings me to the title of today's talk, Beware of Images. So in 1929, the Belgian artist René Magritte created the treachery of images. Uh, when it was pointed out to him that what he had created was in fact a pipe, his answer was, fine, you should try filling it with tobacco then. <laughs> now for the gamers in the audience, I, I also br brought this uh, more contemporary version of it. <laughs> and um, yeah, that, that's not a pipe either. Magritte understood that regardless of the kind of pipe or whether it is rendered by a thin layer of paint or by uh, combining light frequencies, as in this case, uh, images can be very deceiving. In that sense, the treachery of images, more than a painting, serves as a reminder and as a warning sign. As a visual communicator, I've been working with images for over two decades, and I've realized that there are a lot of misconceptions about them, uh, even within the, the design community. So here are a few. A picture is worth a thousand words. So I will ask everyone in the audience to picture a chair. Picture it in your mind with as much detail as, as you can. And when you're done, raise your hand. So picture it and come on. If you have, if you have it in your, in your mind, just raise your hand. And now leave your hand up only if you picture this exact chair. So I'm sure that when I said the word chair, each one of you imagined a different one. So we could say the opposite, that a word is worth a thousand pictures. But the truth is that both equivalencies are wrong. Words 
are, and images are very different mediums. According to legendary media critic Marshall McLuhan, a medium's content is close to irrelevant, and what really shapes our cultural characteristics is the medium itself. So images are usually loud, confrontational, and absolute. And an image-based culture will inevit inevitably start to reflect these attributes. If images were really worth a thousand words, discourse would not be shrinking and becoming more polarized as we moved into a predominantly image-based culture. So another misconception is, I'm not dumb. I can tell the difference between an image and reality. Um, I lost my color separation virginity at the tender age of 16. <laughs> to a gorgeous client, by the way. <laughs> um, by then, I understood that all printed material were merely a collection of, of multi-sized dots. Yet, I never uh, remember, you know, with, even with all this knowledge and acknowledging this, I never remember taking a porn magazine and going, oh, cyan, magenta, <laughs> yellow, 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 black. <laughs> the reason why we get aroused by, um, by images is that our reaction to them is emotional and, and emotional and not intellectual. So it is important to realize the difference between what we are capable of doing and what we actually do. Yes, we are capable of deconstructing every representation technology around us, but we don't. And we don't even really want to deconstruct it because generally we like the illusions that they create. We enjoy them. Another myth is that uh, only ignorant people are persuaded by images. You know, I'm too sophisticated for them to affect me. Ironically, it's those who believe themselves to be more intelligent and sophisticated who often spend the most on constructed illusions. You know, I know we, we rationalize this by arguing that these products are of better quality. But I am sure that Leo's 3.30 p.m. on his, hack, uh, on his tag here are as good as my 3.30 p.m. Um, and, and regarding uh, the purse, uh, unless, you know, whatever you put into a, the LV purse, it's turned into gold. You know, at $5,000, what you're paying for is mostly Scarlett's fee and, uh, you know, and LV's expensive locations throughout the world. You know, another one is I play violent video games and it's not like I'm out there shooting people. And th this one, you know, I'm, I have a blog about this and gamers are really defensive about this point. Um, but, you know, during the, the time of the Roman gladiators, just a few men were doing the actual killing. But a whole crowd was supporting and cheering on the spectacle. So, culturally, what matters are not the specific, the specific violent incidents, but the general public's attitude towards violence. The institutions, markets, laws, and policies of a country will develop in very different ways depending on whether a culture condemns or glamorizes violence. Ancient cultures were uh, very uh, cautious about how they use representation. Today, most people believe to be immune to their persuasive power, and that actually makes us even more um, vulnerable to representations. As the old-time master of propaganda once said, propaganda works best when those who are being manipulated are certain that they are acting on their own free will. It is hard to imagine how so many people could have uh, subscribed to an ideology that today most of us find so abhorrent. But the truth is that when a behavior is normalized by a dominant cultural environment, it becomes invisible. Or, as McLuhan puts it, fish did not discover water. And that is the reason why it's so easy to find fault with other cultures, and it's so hard to find faults within our own. Today we swim, in, we swim in media more than ever before, and images constitute a huge part of our environment. Posters, billboards, TV, magazines, movies, uh, the web, video games. When designers are asked what we do for a living, there's usually a pause followed by a monologue involving the words problem solving. Uh, sound familiar? 
Uh, however, that is just our intended goal. That's not really what we do. Sometimes design can exacerbate a problem or even create new ones. Whether we solve a problem or not, what we really do is organize information. We collect information from our clients, their customers, their, comp their competitors, history, and our own experience. And we organize it into a poster, a website, uh, an app, or a physical product. We don't so much solve the maze as we actually build it. It is the user who will have to navigate the environments we create. Whether we talk about a digital interface or wide-ranging social constructs. For example, an unattractive person might find it much harder to navigate the maze thanks to the narrow standards of beauty that we have helped create and perpetuate. It's very important to pause here and acknowledge that the meaning of the word information changed drastically after uh, crypto cryptographer Claude Shannon. Before him, the term described a part of culture limited to utilitarian words and texts. No one would have called Hamlet information, leave alone the Mona Lisa, Don Giovanni, or Charles Chaplin. But in 1948, Shannon outlined the principles of information theory. He proposed that information could exist independent of meaning. All that was required was an arrangement of discrete structural units. The arrangement could be easily recognizable or not. And the theory worked whether the units happened to be letters, numbers, sound frequencies, pixels, or basic proteins. Today, the term information encompasses everything from a dictionary to a song to the human genome. This is the reason why there is a raging battle to own and control it. Information has become, become synonymous with culture. So as information organizers, designers have become decisive in defining social priorities. When Shannon applied the principles of the second law of thermodynamics to language, he changed the world forever. And that's why I love sciences, particularly physics. As a creative, I'm fascinated by how people like Einstein, Bohr, Feynman, Bohm, Soskin, Witten, Maldacena, and others can completely reimagine and reinvent the whole universe by scribbling a few elegant equations. Dutch physicist Gerard de Hoft, the father of the holographic principle, is among my favorites. It's too bad we have not organized our culture in a way that more people would find his ideas interesting. 1999 was a great year for Mr. Toft. That year he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. 1999 was also great for Britney, as she released her first CD and won the Teen Choice Award. <laughs> and who knows, maybe if Gerard showed a little bit more skin, physics would look a little bit more interesting to people. Um, as it stands, though, people on Facebook are 10,000 times more interested in talking about M&Ms than black holes. <laughs> of course, one of the reasons for these numbers is that a lot more resources are allocated to promoting the latest color of m and than the wonders of deep space singularities. And as we speak, armies of marketers, graphic artists, and visual communicators are still working uh, on solving a very, very important problem. How to create more awareness about products that the whole world already now exist. It's no surprise that obesity and diabetes are rampant in a culture bombarded by marketing messages uh, for, for junk food. But as visual communicators, we often help solve the problem of how our clients can sell more of it. And that's why, jo uh, that, that's why Jorge Frascara rightly stated that the most important problem in design is to decide which is the problem. For example, Mars Incorporated recently had a problem. They wanted to retain Uncle Ben's powerful brand recognition, uh, but having a black servant as a mascot was no longer resonating with the audience. <laughs> so they you know, needed to massage that idea, as, as they say in marketing departments. Um, so they gave $20 million to the creative team of TBWA New York to do something about it. You'll be happy to know that after 65 years as a servant, 
PBWA promoted Uncle Ben to chairman of the board. <laughs> they still didn't give him a first name. He, he's just known now as Chairman Uncle Ben. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Advancing the, the career of, of a fictional character is rather novel. But maybe a better way for Mars to convey their opposition to black exploitation would be to stop profiteering from the underpaid and slave labor of African men, women, and children. I'm sure the 20 mil could have benefited the cocoa workers of the Ivory Coast way more than the advertisers on Madison Avenue. So whose problems are we solving? Is it okay to keep reproducing beautiful depictions of family-run farms for food monopolies? I mean, their manufacturing plants look like that, and they are responsible for destroying the kind of farms displayed on their picturesque labels. Is it okay to keep buying conflict minerals from warlords in the Congo because we choose to design our electronics with pre-planned obsolescence in mind? What problem are we solving by having top fashion designers turning water, a basic necessity of life, into a luxury item? It's like 20 bucks or something like that for those, for those bottles. Um, is it okay to keep demonizing bacteria? We evolved from them, have 10 bacterial cells in our bodies for every human cell. That, that to me is still amazing. The fact that 90% of us is, has DNA from other organisms and only 10% is actually us. Um, and we have coexisted with them for millions of years. Shouldn't we instead focus on warning people about the dangers of plastics? These synthetic petrochemicals didn't even exist 120 years ago and their presence in our bodies can lead to severe health disorders. In general, is it okay to continue supporting the multinationals that are wreaking havoc in the planet? When I studied design, some of my teachers led me to believe that using, using Comic Sans <laughs> or not using proper kerning were among the worst design sins that one could commit. But today, I wholeheartedly agree with Dieter Ram's assessment that indifference towards people and the reality in which they live is the one and only cardinal sin in design. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so after more than two decades solving problems for my clients, I realized that I had a problem of my own. I had honed my skills as a visual communicator and could, change and, and could charge accordingly. But I was thrilled, sorry, but I was not thrilled with what I was communicating. Design had become a tool of the market, and by helping spread consumption and debt, our creative profession was starting to feel rather destructive. I decided to become my own client and pose myself this problem. How could I use my visual communication skills to raise awareness about the problems being generated by visual communications? The result of this assignment is shaping up to be a transmedia project. It all revolves around a fully animated feature-length documentary about the technology, regulation, and social effects of images. There's a Facebook page with a fast-growing community of over 30,000 supporters, as well as speaking engagements like this one, which, quite frankly, is the part that I enjoy the most. Um, and this project has forced me to personally redefine creativity. Before, I had to use my creativity to produce great work for my clients. Now I have to be creative in order to thrive without them. This is the toughest creative challenge I have dealt with so far. And I'm still in the process of figuring it out. But the only thing that I know for sure today is that I want to use my communication skills to communicate ideas that do not promote consumption, but lead to contemplation. Ideas that ask more questions than they answer. Ideas that spread digitally using as little natural resources as possible. And ideas that can help liberate instead of enslave. Thank you very much. Let's chat. Thank you. Like, That's oh, great. You mentioned um, you mentioned that, that 
much of culture now is expressed through digital media now, right? Yes. What implications does that have with copyright in the way that you know culture is cherished and you know shared and valued? You know, like there's a yeah, that, there's a connection there. That that's a about? yeah, that's a great question, and uh, and it could uh, you know it could be the subject of a very long documentary in itself, and I think it, it is the subject of several documentaries. Uh, but to me, the, the, um, the main issue there is on what you expect copyright to do. You know, some people think it's good, some people think it's bad, but it depends on what your definition of, of what copyright should do. Uh, uh, that, that's going to be your answer. Uh, copyright, when it got started in 19, uh, sorry, 19, in uh, 1710 in, in England, um, the, it was very clear the, the law was called uh, a, um, a law for the advancement of, of culture. So in that sense, if, if we go by the definition of how copyright got started and, and, and the idea was to advance culture, then I think it's great. I think digital, <laughs> the digital medium is, is awesome. We, we can share more faster and better than, than ever before. Um, there is an aspect of it that, that usually you know, creative people don't like, which is, well, I need to make a living out of it, and how am I going to make a living if nobody values? And, and it's true that we have lost uh, you know, perceived value, at least for, for culture. Um, I remember buying yeah, LPs, albums, and, and, and really thinking that I had like a, a little piece of gold in my hands and you know, opening them very carefully. And it's very, a very different experience than the way we consume music, for example, these days. Um, but what I think about that is not that it's not the, the fault of copyright itself, but it's, it's a problem with culture itself. It's a problem with how, untitled, uh, so how uh, um, entitled we are. Not, and by we, I mean everyone. I mean the, the, the record labels, the companies, the, the corporations are entitled and they think they, they should own culture forever and, and pretty much everything. But to be you know, honest with ourselves, consumers are extremely entitled as well, and that is a problem that artists are facing. They are caught between, um, you know, between the, the uh, crossfire, in a way, uh, the fight that is going on between the audience, the entitled audience and entitled industry. And, and, and the truth is that I, I wish that we lived in a culture of respect so that a culture of enforcement is not necessary. I don't believe at all in, in censorship. I don't believe in digital right management software and, and any of that stuff. I believe in just getting better education, being more respectful of, of the creative work of others, and that should solve the problem. And, and, and in that way, copyright uh, you know, would become irrelevant, and, and it, can, it is becoming irrelevant just because um, basically today everything is an original and a copy. You know, every identical copy of, of, a, of a song or of a, of a picture is, uh, you know, there, it, it's the original itself again. So uh, it, it's um, a bit ridiculous to be talking about copyright uh, the way that we do, you know, based on a law that, that has so many hundreds of years. And, uh, and yeah, just basically, I think, uh, the, the, the other thing, if I can expand a little bit on it too, is uh, language. I think that uh, everything that, that we consider culture is in a language that we understand. But the, the way that culture gets shared is shared by a language that most people are illiterate at today, which is programming. And, you know, now we're catching up to images and people are using Photoshop and creating their own images and their own, you know, their own um, visual uh, output. But just like in the Middle Ages, there were just a few that could read sacred texts and they held a lot of control over those who, who could not read or write. Now it is programmers that are choosing how things get shared, how, how gets the things get shared, what gets shared, uh, and, and, and the... Um, the standards and the and the um, uh, the framework in which culture gets shared. So I think that the next you know we keep talking about visual literacy, but I think the next step of literacy is going to have to be uh, people need to start learning programming. They need to start at least understanding how it works, so that they can consume and share culture in a way that makes sense to them and not that makes sense to Google or to Facebook or to whoever. Well, that was juicy. <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, my question would be, I'm a design student right now, and so I'm just at the infancy of my career. And my question would be, 
how do you balance ethical design with the need for acquiring the resources to create that ethical design? Yeah, that's... <laughs> I, I, you know, I wish... I wish I had a, a, like a straight answer to that. It, it, I'm still, as, as I said, I'm still uh, figuring it out myself. Um, to be honest, things change when, when you're a student and, and as, you know, as you progress and, and um, uh, you know, get more proficient with the tools and, and also get a better understanding of what it is that you're doing as, as a designer. Uh, I would lie if I tell you that I wasn't just you know, thrilled and excited to work for, uh, you know, for Mars or Nintendo or you know, big corporations when I just graduated. Um, I, I think, to be honest, that a part of that is uh, the fault of the educational institutions. You know, because educational institutions uh, make us believe that, that that's, that's what's cool, that's a great thing, and, and, and in all fairness, because they are businesses at the end of the day, and they have to promote themselves as a business in what people consider uh, as, a, you know, as a standard of quality or, or a, a, you know, as what uh, means something in, in, the, in the world is to, to work for these big corporations. They also you know, use it to promote the institution. And, and, and so we create this uh, idea that, that what's important in design is to have these big accounts, big clients, and, and do uh, big projects. So um, I, I, I would not dare telling anyone at this point, you know, you should do this or you should do that with your career. I think that, um, you know, I know that we do have bills to pay. The one advice I would give you, and, and, and I wish someone had given me that advice when I, when I started, is low overhead. You know, literally, um, that's freedom. That is your freedom right there. Um, at some point, I had three design studios. Well, one, one pre-press studio and one design studio in Mexico, and then one design studio in Vancouver, all of them with offices, all of them rental offices, all of them with, with people. You know, we were doing a lot of work. We were doing a lot of work for, you know, Motorola and, and, and big companies, but uh, I think it's the worst time of my life. I was stressed. I was not enjoying what I was doing. I was taking projects because well, now it's not just me, but other people depend on me taking projects. And it's really slavery. You know, at the end of the day, I think that with design and with everything in life, the, the lower you keep your overhead, the more freedom you buy yourself to then think about what matters to you and, and pursue it. So I, I think that's, that's the best advice I can give you. That's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks for coming. I really appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Your quest for knowledge and making us all aware of this. Um, kind of on the same topic, because I'm curious, how do we all go home or to work today? And maybe um, what sort of questions would we pose to clients to make sure their moral obligations are aligned with ours? And you know, how how can we really bring this up in our work that we that we do every day? That that's a great question because at the end of the day, we do need design. You know, we, we live in designed environments and, and I think it's a profession that it's much needed. And um, in my opinion, what, what, well, what I'm trying to do at least is first of all, um, choosing my clients better, not taking everything. And again, that goes to the low overhead that, that gives you the, the choice of, uh, of clients. Um, and the other thing is realize that uh, this might sound a little bit, you know, negative, but I do think that, that uh, design, particularly commercial design, has become one of the least creative professions in the world. You know, we think that creativity lies on being clever. You know, being clever with a, with a, let's say, a direct mail piece. Even though we know that direct mail is garbage, it's, it's, it's a waste, you know? Like, the, the return of investment is one of the lowest returns of investments that, that you can get. Uh, but we still do it because you know, we want to do cool graphics for it. We want to see it printed. Um, so I think in that sense, we have become really lazy and really uncreative. The creativity should be in how can I help my client without doing this? How, what are the other mediums that I can pursue? What, uh, you know, what can I suggest to my client? You know, I, it, it always surprises me, for example, that there's no uh, more um, agencies that are actually going to their clients and saying, you know what? Those, $20 million that you were going to spend on, on uh, making Uncle Ben you know, chairman of the board, let's actually spend them on, on, a, on a social um, project and then spend just maybe 19 millions on that project and 1 million just spreading the word about the great thing that we did around. And, and 1 million to spread that you know, would go a long, long way. So in that sense, I think we've become really lazy. It's all about being clever, about being smart, about you know, winking to the audience and, 
And, and also we have structures that don't allow us sometimes to do that because a big agency takes 12% or, or sometimes well, between 7 and 12% cut on, on the media that they book. So, you know, they, they have this invested interest in booking a bunch of billboards, in booking a, a bunch of, uh, uh, of the uh, media that they have a percentage with. So we have to, we have to kind of create new structures, new, way, new ways of thinking, and be creative about that. And stop giving awards just for, you know, for stuff that it's clever and that it looks cool, focusing more on process, focusing more on, on what really helps uh, create a better environment for, for, not for our clients only, but for the consumers, which are in reality our clients. Our, the final client is the, is the consumer. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, Mark. Um, sorry. So you said that at some point you decided that you didn't want to work for companies that you didn't really agree with, with what they were doing. I'm sure there was a build-up to it, but was there a tipping point where you decided that, no, I can't do this anymore? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. There was a tipping point, and uh, I, I love doing uh, CD covers, and that's what I did for about 15 years without uh, taking almost any other projects. I did work for uh, uh, some big corporations, but mostly I was doing CD covers. They, they're paid um, way worse, but it's just more fun. Creatively, it's a similar process, but, uh, but uh, just the, the, the relationship with an artist is very different. You know, sitting with, with a, for example, with Jimena, we just went for dinner and it was, you know, had a, some wine, really nice talk and, and we decided on the idea that we wanted. It's very different than when you sit on a committee, you know, with, with a corporation. So I was doing mostly that. But then when I moved to Vancouver, um, two things happened. First of all, I, I moved here and, and other people were courting my clients in, in Mexico. And that always happens, right? If you're not there, they forget about you. Uh, the other thing that happened, which was more important even, is that the music industry took a dive. And, and today they are, you know, paying, I'm not exaggerating, they're paying like 15, 20% of what they used to pay you know, 15 years ago. So um, I started doing more advertising work here in Vancouver. And at some point, uh, um, Ryan, the same guy that, that gave me the, the project for uh, Intuit, he called me and asked me if I wanted to do um, a project for uh, the bot, bot camp, which is, this is an idea that, you know, I don't know exactly where it started, but uh, it got very popular with, uh, with uh, Axe antiperspirant, deodorants, where, you know, they take um, what they consider alpha male or alpha female, depending on the product, to, you know, it's like a three-day brainwash experience, you know, to tell you how cool this product is. And, of course, there's, if in the case of Botcam, there's a lot of, like, you know, really beautiful uh, models and, and there's a lot of fun activities. And that was a project that I was like, ah, uh, you know, it's, there's money there, but I, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to participate in this? And, and it's not the worst thing, you know, that, that, that can be. It's, it's a, some people might consider a cool project. But at that point, I, I started questioning, you know, what is it that, I, that I'm doing? I enjoy doing CD covers so much. At this point, also, I'm, I'm reading, like, physics and, and other, like, things so much. And I want to communicate that. I'm, like, I have the things that I really want, that really interest me, that I really want to, to speak about. And then these, you know, project that is just basically about convincing people to go, you know, spend three days and being brainwashed about Budweiser. So that was kind of the, the, the point where it all shifted. One more. That's it. You're the big finale. Can you handle it? No pressure. Hi, I'm Faiza. Thank you for coming in today. I was just wondering, how would you motivate people to think critically about media? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, I think it has to be done through media itself. You know, it's, it's a, uh, as I said, I'm not for censoring. When I talk about violent video games and all this, sometimes people misunderstand me and say, oh, what? So, you know, these days everything, as I said, is polarized, right? So if you talk about something that you dislike, immediately it's like, so what? Should we you know, censor video games? Should we censor pornography? I think media is here to stay, and it's only going to increase. Um, so the way I would, I would encourage people to, to uh, you know, have a more productive and more constructive media and think more critically about it is actually by supporting critical media. You know, we all, um, 
we all love it when we watch a, a, an interesting documentary, when we hear a, a lecture that, that inspires us, but yet are very reluctant to, um, to pay for it. I mean, it always surprised me that, for example, the same week that, uh, that Transformers came out, I think Transformers 2 or Transformers 3, I don't know, I've lost count of them. Um, uh, Josh Fox came out with, with uh, his documentary Gasland. And it was just so depressing to see how many theaters carried Transformers, how many people were so thrilled and excited and, and, you know, and talking about Transformer. And this documentary actually talked about, especially in the, if you live in the States, this documentary that talked about issues that really affected your life. That, that, you know, you know, they might be a bit depressing, but you know, it's way more depressing to let them happen and then 20, 30, 40 years down the road realize that, oh my God, you know, we live in a polluted and, and, uh, and um, unwelcoming world. So um, really what I think we have to start doing is uh, stop being entitled. And you know, one of the things I try to do is, is for example, support um, through Kickstarter or, or Indiegogo support projects that I, that I find are uh, worthy. The, the latest one I supported, I donated $50 for a documentary uh, on Alan Turing. And it's a subject I find absolutely fascinating. And I, I've always, you know, I have a little bit about him on, on my documentary, but I always thought someone should do a, a feature on this guy. And, uh, and so, you know, you might think it doesn't change much, but it does. It does change a lot to, to help people do this uh, alternative media, media project. So media, I think, has to be fixed through media. We just have to shift what media we support and, and, and how we regulate it. People have to get involved in regulation. I know most designers and, and in general people are just, you know, they don't like politics, they don't like regulation, but unfortunately, unless everyone gets involved in how media is regulated, um, it, it's like, a, it's like um, Douglas Rushkoff has a, a, a book now called uh, Program or Be Programmed. And that's exactly the, the choices that we have. Either we choose the programming that we're gonna get or we are gonna get, get programmed by someone else. So um, I, I think that that's what I would suggest. Thank you very much, Sergio. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.